Welcome to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast, where Pastor Jeff Cranston, along with our host, Jen Denton, will discuss biblical theology in an understandable way. You'll discover how to apply biblical truth to your life. Thanks for joining us at the table. Let's get started. Well, hello again, y'all, and welcome back to Kitchen Table Theology. I'm your host, Jen Denton, and along with Pastor Jeff Cranston, we believe what Dr. J.I. Packer once wrote in his classic book, Knowing God. A simple Bible reader who is full of the Spirit will develop a far greater relationship with God than a learned scholar who is only content with being theologically correct. And here at Kitchen Table Theology, we are seeking not only to help you know solid biblical theology, but to be led by God to it and therefore develop your relationship with him at a deeper level. And as we begin podcast 118, we want to say thank you for leaving us ratings and reviews. One review we recently received is from Sarah zero seven zero nine zero nine zero nine zero nine zero nine. And Sarah writes, "Wow, Jen and Pastor Jeff really are taking their time to cover some in-depth subjects. Making it a kitchen table atmosphere is awesome and so very approachable and friendly. Very excited to hear more. Thanks, Sarah, for your kind words and your review, and we do deeply appreciate that because it's helping us to reach more and more people. Yeah, thank you, Sarah, very much for that. And for all of you who listen, we're very, very grateful. So, Pastor Jeff, we are recording this, and as we are recording this, we are in the midst of definitely a hot summer. It has been a hot one. (laughs) And you and I have both been burning the candle at both ends and traveling a lot. So, oh You've been gosh, to I've been no, I didn't go no. to Indiana. I didn't go to Indiana. We've been all over Florida. We're we have a college or a soon to be college freshman. So we are doing the college tours right now. So we're kind of all over. How many colleges the have place. you visited? We have visited twelve in person. No, yes, twelve. <laughs> we have visited twelve in person. Yes. So, so that, anybody we with to... a junior or senior out there. <laughs> Jen's an expert. Do not contact me for advice. I am all, it's one thing to do it for other people's children, but it is a completely different ball game when you're doing yours. it for your own. Well, what yeah. about you? Where have all of you been traveling? Family mostly. Myrtle Beach. Good. Cashers, North Carolina, which nice. we love that Beautiful. up there. Asheville. Beautiful. And then all over the upstate, because that's where <laughs> all the grandkids are. And Atlanta. And Florida coming up. And Pigeon Forge coming up. Oh, Pigeon Forge. Yes. Jesus and many golf lovers dream Pigeon Forge. The Myrtle Beach of the mountains. (laughs) It is. Well, hey, although Kitchen Table Theology hasn't been on a hiatus, we feel like we have been just because we've been running around. So therefore, on today's podcast, we are not going to jump back in to the current series, 33 Things That Occur When the Believer, in the Life of the Believer at Salvation. That will resume in our next podcast. Today, we're going to take the always popular, well, for everyone except for me, because I'm on the other side of it, quiz. (laughs) That's right. And you're always a good sport on on the quizzes, and you usually do very, very well. I try to. I, I remember to. one quiz. You missed like the third question. <laughs> oh, and, and I the, couldn't get over the it. The tenth question, you were still going back to I that was. I was still question. stewing over it, yes. You, you were not going to let that go. <laughs> so today we're going to take a quiz based around salvation, or the theological term soteriology. And we did a whole series early on, probably a year or more ago, sure. on soteriology. But since the current series we're in has everything to do with our salvation, well, this would be a good time for a quiz around the doctrine of salvation. So Kitchen Table Theologian, I want to just encourage you to pay close attention to the questions. Think about a good answer. If you get 100% correct, Free kitchen table coffee mug for you. <laughs> we'll sign, we'll send it out to you. So let's see how we do. Quiz might be a little bit easier because it's a true or false. Yeah, 50-50 chance. 50-50. From the onset. And I have found doing these on podcasts that the multiple choice, it just kind of gets muddled up in your gotcha. brain. Yeah. They're easier to look at than to hear. All right, Miss Jen, are you ready? I think so. Ready All or right, not. All right, here we go. Kitchen table theologian, let's go. Number one. After Adam and Eve fell into sin, God immediately determined he would save sinners. So after they sinned, Mm -hmm. right at that moment, God immediately determined he would save sinners. I'm going to go with false on that because God is a man with a plan. 
Well, God's not a man. Let's go back to the very yes. series <laughs> that we did a, on the personhood of God. An omnipotent <laughs> we being all, with a with a plan. We all he know, has a plan. We all know where you were going with that. Okay, you said false. 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 Yes. Okay, the correct answer is false. Before creation, God's plan to save mankind was already in place. Mm-hmm. He had already appointed, Ephesians says, he had already appointed the elect unto glory. That that whole thing on elect, we're going to be doing a podcast on election. Hmm. You know, there's elections coming up in November, mm-hmm. and thankfully this is much better than those. Hmm. Uh, but a that that may be a two or three. That's that's a tough one. Sure, so, yeah, sure. I got to take some time to get ready for that one. Okay, you're one for one. Number one so far two. God's work of salvation depends upon all three persons of the Trinity. God's work of salvation depends upon all three persons persons of the Trinity. Yes, true. I'm going with true because there wouldn't be three if there wasn't a reason for all three. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, however you got there, you're right. It's true. So we, we could sum it up a little bit like this. The Father plans and he directs the work of the Trinity in redemption. So the Father plans and directs it. The Son accomplished it and the Spirit even today, still applies mm-hmm. it to us. Mm-hmm. Based out of Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. Okay. Great. Gents 2 for 2, how so you doing? Far. Number three, every person born has been a sinner, been born a sinner except one, Jesus. Every person who's ever been born has been born a sinner except one, and that's Jesus. True I'm or false? I'm going to go true there as well. He became sin who knew no sin. So we, so you've established that he was born without sin, but how about everybody else? Oh, every person, born every person born has been a sinner. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yeah, true. Everyone has sinned. Romans yes. three twenty three. That's a basic one, except Jesus, who is completely fully human like us. But the writer of Hebrews says, yet without sin. And that verse you just quoted too. She's three for three. All right, kitchen table theologian, how are you doing? Number four. <laughs> every person born except Jesus, needs to be saved from the wrath of God. Every person born except Christ needs to be saved from the wrath of God. True. We did a full podcast on this about how we don't like to talk about the wrath of God, but it still exists. Yes, And we it does. need to be saved from it. In Ephesians 2, Paul says, we are all children of wrath by nature. Mm. And uh, so that's true. So if you said true, you are correct. And... It's because of our, our sin. We we're born into sin, uh, except Jesus, of course, who was without. Number five, with sufficient time and effort, we could make ourselves worthy so God would save us from his wrath. So if, if you and I, if we have just enough time and put <laughs> forth just enough effort, we could make ourselves worthy so God would save us from his wrath. I'm going to go big false on that. <laughs> You're going to say false. I am going to say false. There's nothing we can do within our own right to make us worthy. There is none righteous, no, not one. No matter how long we have or how much, how much effort we expend, the answer is false. We can't reach a point of sinless perfection on this earth, for sure. All right, we are a little, almost a third of the way through, and Jen... Aren't we halfway through? Are we? I think so. I think There's that 18. Was number... we, we just oh, finished I number five. Oh, I thought there were 10. No. I thought there... Okay, well. All right. We're gonna all right, go, well, let's go. We're going to go quicker. <laughs> or we can make it 10 if you no, want to, that's Jen. fine. Okay. We, had, we had to make these people work for their mugs. Number six. All right, number six. Here we go. Because God is love, in the end, every sinner will be saved from his wrath. Because God is love, in the end, every sinner will be saved from his wrath. Oh, uh, as much as we would hope that was the case, it's false. You're going to go with false. I'm going to go with false. That is true. She's six for six. Those who do not know God, who don't obey the gospel, Matthew 25 tells us will be punished with everlasting destruction. So no, God's not going to wait until it's at the end of everything and go, oh, you know what? Everybody, I'm grading on a curve now. Everybody mm-hmm. gets in. Mm-hmm. All right. So that was false. Number seven. A sinner must pray the sinner's prayer to be saved. A, a sinner must pray the sinner's prayer to be saved. And I think what that question is inferring is that there is a particular prayer of salvation mm, or a mm-hmm. what's called a sinner's prayer, and it has certain ingredients to it, and you pray it. We do it here a lot mm-hmm. at church, but the uh, statement is a sinner must pray 
the sinner's prayer to be saved, true or false? I'm going to go with false. I don't think there's a particular formula for the words that you form. If there was, it would be in Scripture, I would Mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. So that answer is false. A sinner's prayer doesn't save anybody. Mm -hmm. Believing the good news of salvation in Christ alone to be saved, that's what saves us. Yep. All right, number eight. Persuading a sinner to believe the good news is primarily the work of the preacher. <laughs> Don't laugh at that. We tell that for that. Persuading a sinner to believe the good news is primarily the work of the preacher. I'm guessing you're going to go false by the laughter. I'm going to go false unless you want that type of weighted job security on your shoulders. <laughs> so it's primarily the work of whom? I would say then it's the work of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. Not that you cannot be your teaching and cannot you're, be you're, used you're a, in that you're a regard. Tool. Yes. I mean, I've been called a tool many times. <laughs> but persuading a sinner to believe the good news is entirely the work of the Holy Spirit. So Jen is eight for eight, kitchen table theologian. How are you? You know, if y'all have been listening, we may be giving away some coffee mugs. And we might. We right. might. Yeah, the true false nature helps a little bit. Let's go. After this question, we'll be halfway through. Okay. A sinner must repent of their sins to be saved. Oh, true. Absolutely. That's absolutely true. Yeah. Saving faith includes repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus. So a sinner must repent of their sins to be saved. True. Number 10, saving faith can be lost if a person commits grievous sin. Saving faith can be lost. So you can lose your salvation if you've really gone and blown it. Like there's a sin out there that could cause you to lose your salvation. True or false? Childhood, Jen, would have answered this question true, true, because that's the doctrine that I was brought up in. Really? Absolutely. Arminianism, but, <laughs> you can lose your salvation. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Thus, I have prayed my own version of the sinner's prayer many times. Numerous times. I've called myself a serial salvationist <laughs> at, at times. But now that I haven't been enlightened by truth, I'm going to say false on that. You are correct, ma'am. So according to 1 Peter one five, God's power sustains the faith of those who are Saved, being saved, causing them to endure to the end. Mm. Saving faith can be lost if a person commits grievous sin. False. All right, Jen is 10 for 10. Kitchen table mm. theologian, how are you doing? Hope you're doing good on this or or well. Uh, bad English. Wow. <laughs> Number 11. For God to justify sinners, his just wrath against them must be satisfied. Let me say that again. Mm. For God to justify sinners... His just wrath against them must be satisfied. I'm going to go true with that one. That backs up the scripture that we just talked about in our earlier And we did a whole podcast Mm -hmm. on this word, propitiation. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite, favorite words. So that's true. Sinners are justified through the redemption that is in Christ, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. That's Romans 3. Propitiation is any sacrifice that satisfies wrath. Mm. And his sacrifice on the cross satisfied the wrath of God. So our justification comes because the Father was satisfied in his wrath because of what Christ did for Mm. us. Mm -hmm. So true. 11 Mm -hmm. for 11. Number 12. Sinners are justified when they believe. Now that's a tough one, I think. Sinners are justified when they believe. Hmm. I'm going to go true on that in light of our current series. How so? 33 things that happen at the moment of salvation. I thought you were talking about what I was preaching on Sundays. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. We're doing a podcast. We We got to shift gears. I I don't even remember that. Yeah. So that's true. Sinners are justified when they believe. We are justified through the propitiatory, mm-hmm. there's I, that word that's again. a great word, mm-hmm. sacrifice of Christ, which is received, Romans 3, 24 and 25, that's received by faith. Mm-hmm. And for those that have been listening for a while, or those of you maybe that are just joining us, we want to remind you where we talked about propitiation yeah, back in idea. episode number 49. And that's again, a long that's time where ago. It has been quite a long time ago, but that's where we define that propitiation is defined as a wrath removing sacrifice, which we know is the cross. Yep. All right. Number 13. Those who believe are adopted by God and become his children. Those who believe are adopted by God and become his children. That's true as well. In yeah. the light of our current series, we, yeah, we, we just recently talked, talked about, about that. that. Yep. 
John 1, 12, to all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Hmm. Jen is 13 for 13 Lucky people. 13. Lucky 13. So let's see if the, well, this isn't luck, but. I don't believe in luck. I was just about to make that Let's see if luck, your luck continues. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Since we don't believe in it. Number 14. <laughs> after sinners are reborn and justified. So we've established all that. After sinners are reborn and justified, the spirit continues to work within them to make them like Christ. Let's Shall say read that, that again? again. Yes. After sinners are reborn and justified. The Spirit continues to work within them to make them like Christ. Yes. I'm going to go with true, true. on that one. Yes. That's true. That's the whole doctrine of sanctification. Mm. Ephesians 4, believers are being created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And Second Corinthians tells us that believers are being transformed by the Lord, who is the Spirit. So that continual work of the Spirit is going on until the day we die, and then who knows what happens after that. Mm. We'll still be in the Spirit, even after death. Number 15, my palms are sweating. I'm getting some There we go. Well, we're coming in the final stretch. We've only got four to go. (laughs) Becoming holy is a matter of letting go of all effort and letting the Spirit do His work within. This is almost sounding like a trick question to me. Let me do this again. (laughs) Becoming holy is a matter of letting go of all effort and letting the Spirit... Do his work within. Hmm. True or false? I really want to say true on that because it is a matter of letting go of what we are doing in and of ourselves. But then faith without works is dead. I'm going to go with true. I'm going to go against my my gut for a second. It's false. Oh, I meant I meant go I meant go false because I said I wanted to say because I said I wanted to say true, so I was going to go against my gut and say false. All right, just tell us. Uh, I got that one wrong. Okay, just so tell us. <laughs> the work of the Holy Spirit yes. within the believer is the incentive for us to work to become more like Christ. Yes. So there there is a part where we have that we play in this. Okay. Paul encouraged the Philippians. He was he he was talking to them about continue in your obedience by working out your own salvation because God was working in them both to will and to work for his good pleasure. I feel like just the way that was written. I was on the right track, so I get a half point for it's, that. It's not our effort. <laughs> it's not our effort. That's what I was stuck on. But yeah, we still that's what have I was stuck to on. N- this is post salvation. Sure. So we okay. still have to walk in obedience. We still have to make those choices as the Spirit leads us. So we're not saved by our effort, but we can walk out our salvation when we're putting in the work mm-hmm. as the Holy Spirit guides and directs us and we walk with Him in that. And those are continual choices that we must make on a daily basis. So I think positionally it's false. Experientially, we it feels true mm-hmm. because the more I get out of the way, the more the spirit is elevated, the better sure. off my Christian life is going to be. So we we'll take just, a half point. Yeah, we we may end up throwing that one out. <laughs> Kitchen table theologian. If you get these all right except fifteen, I'll still send you a coffee mug. Oh, isn't that nice? Number sixteen. <laughs> the presence of the Holy Spirit producing Christ likeness within believers means it is possible for them to become perfectly righteous in this life. I think the keys there are perfectly righteous. Mm. Let me me say it again. (laughs) The presence of the Holy Spirit producing Christ-likeness within believers means it is possible for them to become perfectly righteous in this life. I'm going to go with false on that. Yeah, that... I'm when stuck on that this side of heaven. Perfectly righteous that, in this yes. life. That never happened. <laughs> sure. Uh, the, the good old Westminster Confession of Faith addresses this. And it's, it's, it says growth in Christ's likeness is always, and here's how they word it, imperfect in this life. They're abiding still some remnants of corruption in every part. Mm. So yeah, we're, we're never going to achieve perfect righteousness in this life. Hmm. Because we still, you know, Paul talked about the old man and the old nature and it's warring with the new nature and mm-hmm. the carnal is warring with the spirit. Mm-hmm. All right. Dos mas. Two more. And we're, here we go. The act of baptism is a guarantee of the believer's final salvation. The act of baptism is a guarantee of the believer's final salvation. That's absolutely false. And all of your 
Baptist friends say amen and hallelujah. That, that's false. <laughs> what guarantees the believer's final salvation? Well, it really should be who guarantees. The presence of the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of the believer's final salvation, not baptism. Those who believe, Paul writes in Ephesians 1, those who believe have been sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. Mm-hmm. All right, mm-hmm. last one. Drum roll. <laughs> God's work of salvation will be completed when Christ comes again and all believers, those who have died and those who remain alive, receive their resurrected bodies. One more time. God's work of salvation will be completed when Christ comes again and all believers, those who have died and those who remain alive, receive their resurrection bodies. True. The plan will come into fruition. So that's all your eschatology. Yes. Mm-hmm. True. Mm -hmm. On the last day, believers that are then found alive shall in a moment be changed, and those who have died shall be raised in power, spiritual, incorruptible, and made like Christ and his glorious body. So there you have it. That last answer was true. So how did you do, kitchen table theologian? Some of those were a little hard. Some of them maybe not as much. Jen nailed it. I got a nine and a half. If I had a button to push, <laughs> a nine point five. If I had an applause 10. button to push, I would push it right now. You did really, really, really oh, well goodness. on that. Where does this quiz come from? This quiz, and I've used this guy's quiz before. It's a guy named Tim Challies, hmm. and Challies is spelled C H A L L I E S. And if you just go to challies.com, among blog posts and other things, he's put up four or five doctrinal quizzes. And I pulled some of the questions out of one mm-hmm. of one of these. So we want to give our thanks and our props to Tim Challies at challies.com. And perhaps to our kitchen table theologians. How did you all do? Well, listen, if you got all 18 right, we <laughs> definitely want to know that. Absolutely. So the best way to let us know is write to Pastor Jeff at LowCountryCC.org. Pastor Jeff at LowCountryCC.org. If you got them all right, we would love to send you a free kitchen table coffee mug. If you missed 15 and got all the other (laughs) 17 right, we'll still send you a coffee mug. Because 15 was a little wonky. So I, I curved it for everybody. You, the gen I curved did. it for everybody. <laughs> the, gen, the gen curve is now in effect. Yeah, but do let us know. We would love to hear how you did on this. Sure. And maybe while you're there, you can ask a question. We always love your questions yeah. because we love putting together a podcast where we answer some of those questions. We've got a Q&A that we, we need to do probably in the next month or so. Great. I've got a bunch of questions. Great. Well, hey, thanks so much for tuning in today and listening to Kitchen Table Theology. Take a moment, wherever you're listening from, to leave us a rating or a review, including on Spotify and iTunes. It really helps us to get new listeners finding the show, and it helps us to spread that Kitchen Table Theology love. And don't forget to check out today's episode notes as well. Go ahead and head on over to jeffcranston.com for more information about Dr. Cranston, his books, sermons, leadership notes, and blog posts. And Lord willing, next week, we'll be back with another great episode as we continue in our series on the things that happen to the believer instantaneously at the moment of salvation. So there it is. Now go deeper. And until next time, always remember that the real power of theology is not only knowing it, but applying it. You've been listening to the Kitchen Table Theology Podcast with Jen Denton and Pastor Jeff Cranston. Join us next time for more insights into biblical truth. If you'd like to know more on today's topic, you can check out the show notes at jeffcranston.com. You can also email us at pastorjeff at lowcountrycc.org. If you're enjoying this podcast, would you consider leaving a rating and review on iTunes? We deeply appreciate your help in getting the word out. And be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or in your favorite podcasting app to continue this journey with us as we learn about and apply God's Word to our lives. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time here at Kitchen Table Theology.